That's actually for that's actually for Chris. Okay, so let's get started. We're starting a little bit late. Uh, this is Python Gone Bananas, monkey patching in Python. Uh, we are at Pi Gotham 2016. It's Sunday, July 17, 2016. Hi everyone. I'm James. Hi, James. Wow, that was really good. That was a really good response. Before I get started with this talk, I wanted to give you a disclaimer. I won't be upset if you all walk out. This is not one of the usual types of talks that I give. Usually I give talks about don't use this code. You can see that's what I am on Twitter and that's my email address. I tell you about really weird, wild things you can do in Python. This talk is something different. I thought I'd go back to my roots and I'd give you a talk about something genuinely useful, maybe educational, something practical, something that many of you can employ in your actual work. This is a novice to novice intermediate talk. It's very similar to one of the very first talks I ever gave. In fact, my very first talk conference was in 2012 at Pi Gotham. The conference organizer that year, Gloria, uh, had met up with me after a NYC Python event, and we were at Burger King, and she said, you know, Pi Gotham's in a week and a half. You want to go give a talk? And I said, sure. And I spent the next week and a half furiously preparing as much material as I could. I took that talk, and I presented it at Pi Data that same year, and I went to Pi Arkansas, and I went to Pi Texas. Since then, I've spoken at a number of other events. And you can see, I think I'm on my 40th, I think this is my 40th conference that I've presented at. I think it's the 50th or 60th talk I've ever given. For many of you in the audience, this conference you have ever attended. And you've seen the kind of energy and the kind of life that you can, you, you see what can be done when you present your materials in this forum to this kind of audience. You see how powerful that is. Many of you are nervous, you think, I could never give a talk. That could never be me on stage, but I want to tell you, it just starts with one powerful thing about Pi Gotham. We love to give you opportunities to speak, and we really love to see up and coming new speakers, because who knows, any one of you might come back next year, give your very first conference talk, and end up like a conference junkie like me <laughs> four years later, given, I've given like 70 talks. Now I'll tell you what, it's okay to be nervous. I'm nervous before every single one of my talks. I can't even, I, I tried to put together the list of all the conferences I've spoken at. I can't literally not remember all the talks I've given, and yet I'm still nervous every single time. It's just the way it is, and it's okay. So this talk is about monkey patching. Patching is a kind of softer term for what other people might call gorilla patching. Gorilla patching and monkey patching are essentially changing the runtime state of a program using some mechanisms. Now, this talk may be a little bit different than some of the other talks you've seen about core Python materials. This talk is not the why, but the how. I won't tell you when you want a monkey patch or why you want a monkey patch. I would think that when you have a need to do this, this mechanism will probably be the most obvious way to solve your problem. There are probably a lot of other talks out there that can explain better than I can some of the when you want to use this mechanism. Instead, I'm going to focus on the how, just the nuts and the bolts. It's very similar to the very first talk I ever gave, which was the nuts and bolts of generators and context managers and decorators. One thing I want to do in this talk is try to put forward a couple of mental models, some simple ways to think about how the Python language works that will help you in your everyday Python programming and will make what appears to be a very complicated, very dangerous thing to do just seem obvious. I told one of my colleagues about this talk. And he said, oh, you're just going to talk about the mock library. And it is true that monkey patching is very widely used when people are doing testing. You could think that in a production system, you have code that does actual things. And you might want to mock that code. You might want to replace code that does actual things like save to a database or load from a database with simulated code that just checks to see if that behavior behaves correctly. And I'm not going to talk about mock. I'm not going to about talk about testing. There are a lot of good talks out there on that material. I'll tell you that when I started to write this talk at around, let's see, I got home last night at 11 o'clock, and I think there was a new episode of Suits, so I had to watch that. And then it was like 12.15, and I was like, oh my goodness, I have to talk tomorrow. So about 12, about 1.30 last night, because I, I did all my laundry, I cleaned all my house. Procrastination is really good for getting things done that aren't the thing you wanted to get done, but everything else in your life. I thought, okay, I have to write my talk. I started was, what is mo a monkey patch? 
I wanted to include this link for you because this is a Stack Overflow link that tells you what is a monkey patch. And one of our organizer is actually a very well-known person on Stack Overflow, and he has a very nice answer here, just explaining a little bit of the usage of monkey packing. So if you see Aaron Hall, he's one of our, organ one of our organizers for the Meetup group, you can ask him and he'll point you to his Stack Overflow answer. One note for all that I'm going to show you is I'm only going to talk about Python 3. I could talk about Python 2 and Python 3, and there's a political choice there on whether I present this information in 2 or 3. What I'll tell you is for sake, I'll show you all of this specific to Python 3. Some of the things that I'm going to show you have actually changed quite dramatically between Python 2 and 3. They've been made easier in Python 3. And I want to show you that because hopefully most of you are using that. It makes my job easier. And to show you both the Python 2 case and the Python 3 case, will my time allotment. So what I want to start with is a couple of puzzles. And for each of these puzzles, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to get feedback from all of you. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds to look at the code and to think what the answer is. For each of these puzzles, I want you to guess what the output or the error is. I will tell you, there are no tricks. I'll show you defining a class. I'm not going to do some weird trick where the class has a bad name or I've, the, the, semicolon, the colon is actually a semicolon. Each of these are actual problems that you might run into. And I'll start very simply. Here I have a class. It's called my class. I do a single assignment in that class. I say id equal. I create an instance of that class called object. I do my class.id. And as many of you know, the id function in Python just gives you the id of some object. So it takes one argument, and it gives you the id, which is just a number. I do my class.id and object.id. First line, this matches what you think will happen. It worked, and it worked. Now, in this case, the exact output, you might not be able to guess, but that's not important. If you guess that both of these worked, then that's good. Let's take another example. I wrote a custom function called myID. All it does is it calls the ID function. I have a class called, I assign myID equals to myID. I create an instance of that class. Does my class dot my ID work? No, it doesn't. Oh, we have to evaluate these. Yes, it does. Does object dot my ID work? No, it doesn't. So immediately we see something. There's a puzzle here. What's going on? Why is there a difference here? In the next two examples, I'll use two mathematical functions, sine and cosine. And so I'll just show you, just, just to be absolutely gratuitous, here's my little notebook just to remind you of what the sine and the cosine function look like. The sine function is in red. It starts at 0. It goes to 1 at pi over 2. It goes down to 0 at pi, and so it's inverted. Here, I import pi from the math module, and I create a new class. And I say, from math, import sine. Is that legal? Can I do that in a class body? Does that work? I create an instance of this class. I call the sine method on my class with pi over 2. Well, sine of pi over 2 should be 1 on the instance. Does this work? Well, it seems to. Does this line work? Yes. Does this line work? Yes, it does. Let's do something else. This is in Jupyter Notebook, so some of the syntax at the top of the cells may, may not be familiar to all of you. File. That file is called mod.py. It's just a Python module. In that mod.py Python module, I'll import cosine from the math module. I'll write a function called my cosine, and I'll just call cosine. I'll create my own class, and I'll do the import. Well, we, we saw that work before, so it should work here. I'll call my class. Does that work? Yes, and it gives me the answer I expect. Does it work on the instance? No. Why not? Here's another puzzle. I have a class, and I assign some variable to a lambda, x. And I return x times 2. Well, this works. There's nothing strange about it. Call this method on the class. Yes, it works. Can I call it on the instance? No, it fails. And one thing that you might immediately see is, well, isn't there a self-parameter somewhere in here? That's a good hint. We'll try an even simpler example. Here I have a class, and it has a function in it. It takes the first parameter, self. We call this implicit self. And it takes another parameter, x, and it returns x squared. This is very standard code. That should definitely work. Does my class.square work? No, it doesn't. It's missing a parameter. Does object.square work? Yes, it does. Here's another puzzle called my class. It doesn't have anything in it. I have a function called message. All it does is it prints out pygotham2016. 
I assign message to my class.message. I create an instance of this class. Does my class.message work? No, does object.message work? Yes, it does. Let's try another example. Instead of assigning message after or before I create the instance, what if I assign it after I create the instance? I create an instance of this class, then I assign message to the class itself after I've created it. This still works, but does this work? No, it doesn't. It's missing a method or it's missing an argument. Does the second one work? Yes, it does. Lastly, I assign the message function onto the instance. Does this, does this work? No, it doesn't. Here's one, two more, two more examples, and then we'll talk about why some of these work and why some of these don't work. I create a folder called folder. In that folder, I create a module, mod.member. I have two modules called mod.py, one in the folder from which this notebook is running, and another one in this folder called folder. Maybe I should have called this my folder, but I didn't. I'll create this, and it just writes a file. Here, in a separate Python interpreter, so I don't screw around with anything else in the notebook, I append this folder path to my sys.path. And then I try and import message from my module. Remember, only the module that I just wrote has that message variable in it. The one that I wrote a long time ago didn't have that at all. It only had my, my cosine function in it. Does this work? Because Python is going to look for that module when I try and import it. Where is it going to look? It's going to look at sys.path. The first part of sys.path is the current directory. It's going to go to the current directory. It's going to find the module that I created in my previous example. It's going to say, there's no message variable in that module, and it's going to blow up on me. So obviously, cannot import name message. If I, and, and to show you why that is, if I were to import that module and look at where that module is located relative to my current directory, it's in my current directory. When I do that import, it finds the mod.py in my current directory, not the one that's the first place it's going to look. So you could think if I used insert and I put that folder path at the very beginning of the path, that'll be the first place it'll look. It'll find that module in the folder directory. And then this should work. So here, I say the first place you should look is my folder. That's probably a little bit more confusing than I thought it would be at 2.30 AM last night. Because I didn't say I started working at 1.30, but I didn't say that I actually got that far dragging my feet. This should work. And it works as we expect. The question is, does this work? I say path square brackets folder plus path. Instead of using the dot insert method, I do this. Does this work? No, it doesn't. Oh, there's a type. That still doesn't work. Don't worry. Here's another puzzle. I have a for loop in a class body. Can I do that? Is that OK? Is that moral? Is that in good taste? <laughs> I'd say it's probably not in good taste. The morality of it, some people say code has no morality to it. I don't believe that. But I wouldn't say that this is a particularly odious piece of code. But the question is, does it work? It seems to. I can have a for loop in a class body. Let's see what this for loop does. Well, it iterates from the numbers from 0 up to 9. And it amends this local variable. It creates a local variable, x underscore that number, and sets it equal to that number times 10. So if I say object dot x0, x1, and x2, that give me the numbers 0, 10, and 20. Does it actually work like that? Yes, it does. That's kind of weird. Here's another question. Can I do an if else in a class body? Does that work? Here I say x equals 10. If 10 is greater than 5, define message as this. Otherwise, define message as this. Does this, that work? It's probably not something you want to do, but let's see. Well, 10 is greater than 5. So it prints out PyGotham is awesome. If I change this to 1 and reevaluate these two, it prints out the other one. So that seems to work. Why does that work? Lastly, and the last puzzle I want is tell me the difference between these two. Can anyone tell me the difference, other than what they look like, the difference between these two structures? From x import y, printing y, 
or import x and printing x dot y. That's the last puzzle that we will answer in this session. So the answer, or the all of these, and the key to thinking about how and why monkey patching works the way it does in Python, is to remember that the Python interpreter is a very simple interpreter. It's very straightforward. If you look at a Python file and you execute in your mind the lines of code from the top to the bottom of the file, you are doing almost exactly what the Python interpreter does. Many variants with other languages, like C or C++ or Java, languages have a complex compiler step. And first, the compiler does some magic. It produces some binary. And in that binary, you may not always be able to predict line by line what code is being executed. Python does not work in that fashion. At least C Python does not. It's it some code, and you can execute it in your mind, line by line, from top to bottom. And that's very close to what the Python interpreter internally is doing. I don't think we had a introductory bytecode talk, but I've given introductory bytecode talks before. But you can also you can often see the close correspondence to actual lines of Python that it's doing. It's a very close correspondence, and that's done in order to keep the language simple, in order to keep the language flexible, and in order to make some of the things that I'm going to show you here very easy to do, where they're otherwise actually fairly difficult to do in languages like C++ and Java. So we know that the Python interpreter operates linearly from top to bottom. It doesn't have a separate definition or declare step as you have in C, C++, or Java. A def statement in Python just says, figure out what code's under this, create a code object, create a function object, call it this name. What happens in a class body? It sees a class body. It sees some code under that. The code under that class body looks at all the local variables that were created, says these local variables are attributes on that class, and that's it. That's all that happens. One question that is relevant, and you should ask yourself, is does Python have a step that we could call compilation? Who thinks Python has it? A couple people. Who thinks Python doesn't have a compilation step? Who's ready to go home right about now? <laughs> Nobody, that's good. So let's, let's think about what that means. Oftentimes, when people talk about interpreted versus compiled language, distinguishing between is the way in which we use that language. In a language like C or C++ or Java, the way we use and develop in that language is different than in Python. We often write some code. We subject it to verification by a compiler. We go for a coffee break. We come back. And then we run some tests, and we see if that code works. We're used to a very interactive method of, inter uh, of working with our code. We write one line of code, and we immediately interact with that. There's not that strict difference. That's not that strong line, that stark line between writing the code and trying out the code. You work in a more iterative way. You, you write a little bit here, and you test it out. You write a little bit more, and you interact with your code live. Use that to find some bugs. Incorporate that back into your script, and then start the cycle over. Python, however, does have a compilation step. If we were to say Python had a compilation step, we would say that it's the step which takes all of the source text that you write and generates bytecode from it. That's almost nothing interesting or useful. It catches almost no errors. At the most, it could catch some name errors, but it catches almost no errors, unlike in a language like C or C++ or Java, where the compilation step can catch a certain class of errors. That compilation step does one thing, which is how to generate bytecode from source text. And one interesting thing that it does in that process is it figures out where variables came from. It sees the name of a variable that you're trying to do something with, an arithmetic expression or printing it out to the screen. And it says, was this a local variable? Was this a global variable? Did this variable come from a closure? Where this variable came from? And it emits special bytecodes in those cases. We'll see this become relevant in just a few minutes. The other thing I will tell you is that the Python com because even though Python doesn't have a compilation step, one thing that we can think of in how we interact with our code is that time is equivalent in many cases to a compilation step. That is to say, people who write code in Java or C++ are used to running their code by a compiler, having the compiler tell them some things about whether the code is correct or not, and using that to determine the production worthiness of their code. In Python, if you can add certain checks or certain constraints to the top level of a module, when a module is imported, the code is run from top to bottom linearly. Well, module import is actually something that you could do ahead of time. You could take a code base and import all your modules, 
see if they worked, and any checks that you included at that top level of that module could be used. And so module import time, in many ways, is very similar to compile time, or a little bit closer to compile time, for those of us who are used to that. So let's take a look at a module. This is a little Python module, and it has a variable called x. It sets x equal to 10. If x is greater than 5, it forms this class definition. Otherwise, it performs this class definition. Most of us who are looking at this code say, this makes, pretty much, this makes sense. If, since x is 10, we'll go down this branch, and my class will be defined to this thing. If x were less than 5, we define it to this. And we look at this and we'd say, that just works. That should work. In fact, it works and does exactly what we expect. If I say x equals 1, then the branch we enter is this branch here. My class is defined to this version, which has a different message function. Pi got them is fun. So if I reevaluate this cell and reevaluate re this cell, the behavior we see is exactly what we'd expect. Take that exact same behavior and put it inside the class body, nothing changes. Just as that cell, which is equivalent to a Python module in the Jupyter world, runs all the code from top to bottom and performs all of those definitions live, the exact same thing happens inside the class body. We run all the code from top to bottom and we perform the def So the definition of this message function is performed live based on the state of this x variable when this code runs. So when I run this, it does exactly what you think. And if I do a object.message here, and if I change what the x variable is, it changes exactly in the fashion you think. The if else from outside the class to inside the class. But the way that we can think about how the interpreter moves through that code is actually identical. Before I talk about the next puzzle, I want to discuss briefly what this locals function is. Locals is a function that tells you all of your local variables, all the variables that you have. Here's a simple Python script that creates three variables, x, y, and z. I print out my locals, and in my locals, I should see x is here, z is here, and y, and y is here. And you can see that this locals function returns a dictionary mapping the names of my variables values are. Here's one quick question. Does this work? If I amend this locals dictionary, set x equal to 20, does the value of x change when I print it out? Is that value reflected on this line? In fact, it is. When Python sees this code, it sees all of this little scope. It has to answer in that compilation step, where did x come from? What does it say? Well, x came from my global scope. Or it came from the variables that I have. It came from my global scope. And it emits a bytecode called probably load global. I'd have to check the bytecode to tell you for certain, but it probably emits load global. When it does that, it'll actually reflect all the differences in this that you make to this local dictionary. Here, if I were to just create this variable, the Python interpreter, when trying to produce bytecode from this code, says, I don't know where the x variable came from. It's probably some local variable I was introduced somewhere. And it gets picked up from this amendment, from this mutation that I did to this local state. So both of these work exactly as you might expect. However, if I take exactly the same code and I put it inside a function body, it no longer works. And I want to tell you why that happens. So here, I set x equal to 10. I try to change x, and then I print out x. x is still set to 10. Why did that work that way? Well, what happens is, inside that function body, Python said, where did this x variable came from? It's probably a local variable, because I see it defined here. It emits a special bytecode instruction called load fast. This is done for performance reasons, because it's very rare to do in Python. Most code doesn't need to do this. There are other mechanisms to use. So they said, it breaks that use case, but that's not a very good use case. When you load fast, you look up that variable from a different place than where you're amending it by changing this locals dictionary. Not the greatest step I can go into with the time that I have allotted, but if we have time for questions, I'd love to show you a little bit more about what the bytecodes are. This is relevant, however, in our next example. Here, in this next example, the Python interpreter sees a variable called x. It has no idea where it assumes it's a global variable. Here, I try to create x as a local variable. I get a name error. I can't find x, even though this line said, oh, no, no, add it in there as a local variable. Nope, the Python interpreter cannot find an x variable. And at the compilation step, at the parsing step, it gives me a name error. 
However, we can see the behavior that occurs inside a class body is somewhat different. The behavior inside a class body is very similar to what happens inside a module. So we'd expect mutations to the locals variable to be just like they were inside a module. So we'd expect this to work. If x is equal to 10, and then I amend it, I mutate it, close dictionary, I should see that when I look at the x attribute on my class. Similarly, if I were to create a brand new x in this scope, I should see it reflected here. Let's go back to our example. In this example, I just create a bunch of variables called x underscore something, and that's why this works just as you might naively expect. For some of these puzzles, I feel like there's a little valley between if you don't know anything, you might look at this and say, oh, of course it works. And then as you learn a little bit more Python, you say, well, I'm not sure. And then when you learn a little bit more Python, you say, of course it works. A little bit nudged in that direction. And that's the example to our, or that's the answer for why this works. Before I talk about the next puzzle, I want to briefly discuss with you IDs and objects and mutability and immutability. Here I have a variable called x. I used this ID function earlier. What is the ID? It gives me a unique number for every object. In CPython, if I look at hex of ID, it gives me the hexadecimal representation of that number. This hexadecimal representation should trigger some memories for, for you, especially those of you who are C or C++ programmers. This looks like a memory address. In fact, the ID of an object, the standard doesn't guarantee this, but the ID of an object is basically the memory address of that object. So x is a variable that lives at this memory address in my running program. Here, I have x, and I add 1 to x. Notice change. It went from c to e. Why is that? Numbers, like strings and tuples, are immutable in Python. You can't change them in place. Every time you perform an operation that changes a number by doubling it or adding 1 to it, you actually allocate a brand new number. And so the x variable here, referring to 10, the x variable here just had its name reassigned. But that 10, that little piece of memory there that stored the number 10, is still sitting around in memory somewhere. Just nobody's referring to it. There's no variable that refers to it. There's no name that refers to it. That's why this ID changes. If I have a list, however, mutable, we can change them in place. You can see I create a list with three values. It has some ID. I append to that list. I add an element to the end of that list. You can see the ID does not change at all. I've mutated that list. I've changed it in place. And if I look at that list and say, is the number four in, in five? Of course it is. I append it in the last line. Let me try something a little bit funnier. X and Y are both names that refer to the same list in memory. One, two, three. They have the exact same memory address because they both refer to the exact same list. If I appended 4 to x, you'd see 4 and y. If you numbers to x, you'd see those in y as well. Because they're both referring to the exact same object. If I do this line, I say x equals x plus square brackets 4. What happens? In many cases, in the Python syntax, instead of changing something in place, especially with this arithmetic syntax, this augmented assignment, instead of changing x in place, what this says is create a brand new list by taking the elements of x putting 4 at the end, and call that x. y still refers to my original list. x now refers to a brand new list that happens to be all the original context copied plus a 4 at the end. That the idea of x is totally different than before. What we'll see is if we add 5 to the end of x, that 5 will not be inside of y because y is the original list with the original id. Take a look at, if we take a look at our original question, path.insert, what is this doing? The sys module has a variable called path. The path variable is a list of strings. Those strings represent paths, directories on your system, where you'll look for Python modules and packages to import. Path.insert. It takes the actual path variable, the actual list that's used inside the interpreter, that's used inside the import library, and it'll add an element to the beginning of it. It'll mutate it in place. So this should work. If I say path equals square brackets folder plus path, this will say in my module, I have a new variable called path. 
that's equal to whatever was in sys.path path with something appended to it. But the actual underlying sys.path path was never changed. So when I run this, and I'll remove this code and I'll show you from sys import path, and I'll show you from sys import path, you can see there's no folder at the end. What I might want to do, and what you're encouraged to do, is write this code like this. sys.path equals folder.sys.path. Here I'm actually changing the path list in the sys module, the added folder at the beginning. That's why that example didn't work. And this is something that you'll see in a couple of different circumstances. Here I have three functions that ostensibly do the same thing. In the first one, I take some list called x and I call dot clear on it. In the second one, I use a del operator. And the third one, I assign it to an If I run this code and I try with clear, will it change the x variable that's outside of this function? Yes. x dot clear calls a clear method on the original object. What about del? Del deletes all the contents of the original object. What about the assignment? Note binds to a variable called x in the local scope of this function, an empty list. So this will not reflect the change that I tried to perform inside my function. The last set of puzzles can be answered by thinking about Python in, a, in terms of a set of ad hoc protocols. One thing that you learn deeper into Python, and you look at the data model methods in Python, all those methods that have two underscores before and after, and seem to conveniently correspond to top level methods. For len, there's underscore underscore len. I hate dunder, I don't like that word. For repr, you have repr with two underscores. For, for the addition operator, you have addition with two underscores before and after, I add, and so forth and so on. These protocols. The two protocols that we'll talk about in the time that we have remaining are the get attribute protocol and the descriptor protocol because they can answer a lot of the how for why monkey patching works the way it does. Here, I have two classes and an instance. One class is called A, the next class is called B, and B derives from A. A is the base class for B, B is a derived class for A. I have an object that is an instance of the class B. I set an instance on the instance itself. I say object.message equals Python, is, Pygotham is awesome. If I try and print out object.message, does anything get printed out? Of course, it prints out Pygotham is awesome. I just added that there. I added that information to the instance variable. If I want a mention that's been added to an instance of a class, I can look at the underscore dict item of the class. And you can see this is all the information I've added just to the instance. I could do the same thing with the class itself. Oops. And you can see. I didn't really add anything interesting to this class. I just, let's take a look at this example again. Here, I assign message equals pygotham is fun to my base class. Let me run that code. And when I look at object.message, what happens? Behind the scenes, I invoke the get, the get attribute protocol is actually fairly simple. Now, there's a little bit of complication when you look at underscore, underscore, get adder, and underscore, underscore, get attribute. But we'll put that aside for the purposes of this talk. What happens when I say object.message? I first go to that, I, this line, this piece of syntax is saying, Python, message, and I want it on the object, use the get attribute protocol to figure out how I get that variable out. What does that protocol do? It goes to the instance and says, instance, do you have a variable called message defined in your dict? If the instance does, it'll give you that. If the instance doesn't, it'll say, no, I don't. Check my class. If the class has returned that, if the class doesn't have one, it'll say, check my base class. And we'll keep checking until we hit the end. And I'll show you where the end is. So here, that works fine. I pulled a message variable off of the class called A. If I said b.message equals pygotham has cool talks, what'll happen when I say object.message? instance, do you have a variable called message? Nope, I still don't. It'll ask its type. B, do you have an a variable called instance? Yes, I do. It was added on the line right above. And so this will give you Pygotham has cool talks. Including this one. You might wonder what's the order in which the Python interpreter looks for these things. 
there was a talk given, I think, right before this session by one of the people sitting in this room, Amit, on MRO, the method resolution order. I encourage you all, if you're interested in this, to look at his talk when it's posted to YouTube. The MRO tells you the order in which we look for these attributes. So here, if I'm looking for something called MSG on some instance, I'll first look in the instance, then I'll look in B, then I'll look in A, then I'll look at the end, the top level object. If top level object doesn't have it, it'll emit a warning saying attribute error, no such attributes. However, there is one complication. There is one additional protocol that intersects with, interacts with this protocol. It's called the descriptor protocol. When the get attribute protocol moves past the instance and starts asking the classes up the chain, do you have this attribute? Of course I do. And then I'll ask it one more question. That second question it'll ask is, does that thing you're about to give me back have a, have a method on it with underscores before and after it called get or set or delete? In this case, we'll only look at get. And if that thing does have a get method, it'll say, don't give me the actual thing itself. Call that get method with a couple of special parameters and give me what that returns. I'll show you an example of that in practice. Here I have a class. It has two things inside of it, a variable called message and a variable called descriptor, because this is the descriptor part. When I say object.message, what happens? I ask the instance, do you have this variable? The instance says, no, I don't. Ask my class. I ask the class. The class says, uh, I think I do. It looks at what it has. It's just a string. It returns a string outright. When I ask it for this descriptor attribute, what does it do? It says, so I'll ask my class. The class says, do I have it? Yes, I do. It'll pull that thing out, and it would return this thing here, except that one extra step it takes is it says, the thing I'm about to return, does that have a get method on it? Oh, it does. So instead of returning that thing, return what happens when you call that thing. And so what you'll see on this step is we'll, we'll perform this print and we'll return Pygotham 2016 is often. You may wonder how the property decorator works in Python. This is how the property decorator works in Python. When you ask for something that looks like an attribute, instead, behind the scenes, you call some code. This is done using implementation of the descriptor protocol. Let's take a look at the ID function we looked at at the very beginning of this talk. The ID function is written in C. It's part of the built-ins module. It is not a descriptor. It does not have this get method on it. Let's look at the my ID function that I wrote myself. It's written right here. Does it have the get attribute? Does it have a get method on it? Yes, it does. In Python 3, all functions are descriptors. All functions have a get method on them. What that means is, if you put a function into a class and you look it up through the instance, instead of write, you'll return something slightly different. You'll return whatever happens when whatever, whatever's going to happen, whatever's defined by this get method. And I'll tell you what that get method does. Here's a simple class. It has one method in it called message. If I do object.message, oops, I get this. I get what's called a bound method. One of the nice things that Python 3 did is it removed what was often a, f uh, a very confusing and hard to describe situation in Python 2 with bound and unbound met methods. There are no unbound methods in Python 3. There's only unbound methods. What's a bound method? A bound method is just a very simple wrapper over a function. And all it does is it says, when you call me, I'm going to call the function that I'm wrapping. I'm going to pass in a self as that first parameter. And that's all I'm going to do. That's how the self gets implicitly added whenever you do a function call. This is a bound method. It's bound to this object. So the self that will be put in is this instance, it's, is this instance called obj, and that will be passed in. Let's see that in use. But before we see that, I want to show you something kind of weird. Whenever you do an attribute look, and that attribute is actually a function, and that function invokes its get, its get descriptor protocol component, it'll actually return a brand new bound method. So if I say x equals object.message and y equals object.message, they'll both be bound methods. And they'll actually be different bound methods. Things. There's, I'm not sure why this is. And there's, there's, some, there's almost certainly a good reason behind it. But 
this actually has very real implications. If any of you are working with especially GUI toolkits and you're trying to set up callbacks, and those callbacks are trying to use instance times when you set up callbacks, they're added to what's called a weak dictionary. A dictionary that does not make sure that the object stays, stays around as long as the callback stays around. Otherwise, nothing would ever be garbage collected. Well, those instance methods have nothing referring to them. And they're created fresh every time you do a data lookup, every time you do an attribute lookup. So what you'll have, we'll try and create callbacks on instance methods, and they'll disappear the moment you add them in there. This is a real implication, and there's some weird workarounds you have to do in order to make this work. But let's get back to our puzzles. This was the very first puzzle I showed you. My class, ID equals ID, and my ID equals my ID. What did I say at the beginning? When you have a class body, you, just, you evaluate the lines line by line, you see what was, in the local, what was in the local scope, what are, all the variables are, and you package those up. So saying ID equals ID just says, here's a local variable ID, and it's assigned to the ID function that we're all familiar with. Here's a local variable called my ID, and it's assigned to this my ID that I defined a couple lines above. I create an instance of it. My class.id. I look up the ID attribute through the class. The class says, I have it immediately. It spits it out. What it spits out is the ID function unmolested, and that ID function only takes one argument, obj. So this works. If I say my class, what does it do? It says, I have it myself, spits it out, unmolested, and this works. If I say object.id, what happens? Object, the instance, does not have an ID attribute. So it asks its class. And that's, what, remember, when you start asking the class is when you start it. It asks the class, do you have an ID attribute? The class says, yes, I do. The class says, but before I give it to you, let me just check. Does this ID attribute have a descriptor? Is it a descriptor? Does it have a get method on it? No, it doesn't. Because ID is a C function. And none of the C functions have descriptors, have the descriptor method. So this just works. This is just the ID function that you know and love. Return to you unmolested. However, in this final case, when we say object.myid, we ask object, do you have a myid attribute? No, I don't. Let me ask my, I ask the class. The class says, yes, I do. But before I give it to you, let me check if it's a descriptor. Well, it's a pure Python function, so of course it's a descriptor. So I'm not going to return to you unmolested. In fact, I'm going to wrap it as a bound method. I get a bound method back. I try and call that bound method with one argument. Bound method automatically inserts an extra argument for me, self. What happens here? Uh-oh. I got two arguments when I expected only one. And that's why this puzzle works the way it does. Let's take a look at the next puzzle with the math module. Well, the same, in the same case. The math module is written in C, the sign in C. So exactly the same behavior occurs. When you ask the class for the sign method, you get it out unmolested. When you ask the class for the my cosine method, you get it out unmolested. But when you ask the instance for the sign method, you first check, does this have the descriptor protocol? Yes or no? No, it doesn't. So you get it out unmolested. But when you ask for the my cosine method, the class says, hold on a second. This is a descriptor. I'm going to run this special get function before, and I'm going to give you what that returns. And you end up getting a bound method that's missing an argument. Before we end the set of puzzles, I want to show you a fairly simple example, and I want to work through it line by line. And I want, I want you to see something about name binding, something that should hopefully be obvious. In this code at the very top line, I create a class called my class. It has a single attribute in it called message. And it's just a string. PyGotham is awesome. I create an instance of that class object. I say some message, some variable called some message, is equal to obj.message. You may have heard me use the term bind, name binding. Name binding is often how we refer to the process of creating a variable, a name, and saying what it refers to. So I'm saying the some message variable refers to got returned when I looked up the message variable on the instance called obj. I change what's inside that class. I change my class.message on this line. Will some message be affected? Of course not. I looked it up on this step, and this step here is too late, according to the protocol on this line. And any changes I make to the class aren't going to re-invoke the protocol. This line doesn't say re-invoke the attribute lookup protocol. It just says, 
give me whatever the value is that was set before. And no code is run, it just spits out PyGotham is awesome. This is distinct from if I wrote object. This says invoke that protocol and give me the latest value which will include the change I made on this line. So then these two lines should be obvious or these two, these two form formulations should be obvious in why they're different. Let's assume that there are many lines of code separating the import statement. In the very first example, what do I do? I do an early binding. I say, give me the Y attribute out of the X module as it exists right now. And for the duration of my module, I will always use whatever that variable was set to as of the time when I imported it. And I won't reflect any changes people have made to the Y variable in the X module. On the, in the second example, this line says something. It says x dot y. x dot y is a dotted lookup. It says invoke the attribute protocol. Every time I print out x dot y, I'm saying, I'm going to go to the x module. Give me what the value of y is. Invoke the protocol, and maybe that might have changed. Somebody might have patched something. Somebody might have swapped something out. Here, you'll, in the very top, you'll never reflect a change that was made after the fact, after this import line, to the things in the x module. Here, you're always looking up the live value. And there's a distinction here. This is why both of these syntax, in some cases you want one, in some cases you want the other. In many cases, because very few actual modules in the standard library or on PyPI actually use this. They usually have getters or setters at the module level for setting state. But you can think these are actually two very different things to ask for. And there is meaning in between these two or distinguishing these two. So let's take a look at two final examples. Here I have an example where I'm going to take, I'm going to show you some actual monkey patching. I'm going to take the length function and I'm going to add 10 to it. So when you ask me for the length of the string ABC3, I'll give you 13. That's kind of weird and probably not something that will be very useful. Now in order to make this work, I need to make sure that inside this my length function, I can call the actual length function. If I were to say, my, if I were to call len here, and I were to overwrite what length was set to, then I might, do, I might have some infinite recursion here where I keep trying to call the same method. So what I do is I use, some, I use a closure in order to bind the value of len. It's not that important for how that works, but you can see that it just works. Here, this len function, instead of returning 3, returns 13. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that exact same into a module. But because this kind of binding using the closure is a little bit obscure, and it's not something I've covered, in great depth in this talk. I'll just rewrite this to be a little bit simpler. I'll just say at the very top line, the old len, the original length function, is assigned to this variable called old len, and that's what I'll call here. And I'll just add. And on this line, I say len and builtins.len equals my len. Now, notice one thing that I didn't say explicitly, but every time I have a cell which has a percent percent Python on the top, that's running in a brand new Python interpreter, and it's not reflecting any of the I've done in this notebook. So here, in this script, in this standalone script, I import my module called lenmod, and I print out one, two, three. I've overridden what the length function does to add 10 to every value, and this just works. This is an example of a not very useful, but a fairly straightforward monkey patching in Python. You can monkey patch all of the built-ins in Python. Anytime you call a function in Python, it has to see where did that function come from. Most of the time, that's defined in the built-ins module. Some of the time, you can patch those. Historically, before the introduction of things like import hooks, built-in functions like the import function in order to add custom ways to import code, like importing code when you have to go and download it from a URL. This kind of patching is not that useful. It's not that common, but it does show you how it works and why it works. One thing I would like to say is, well, actually, no, I'll, I'll show you the next example. A more practical example of this is somebody has written some code for you. And instead of my class, this is now your class. And they defined a, a method on it called MSG. But I don't like the way you wrote your code. I want to change. I want to change that class. I, wanna, I have an instance somewhere in my program of the class that you wrote. Let's take, a, let's take a look at some ways that I can change this. Using the same code as before, 
let's create my own function, my message, that says PyGotham is awesome and it has great talk. You're not enthusiastic enough for my purposes. So I want to patch your class. How can I do it? Well, I can just say your class.message equals my message. I'm just swapping out one function for the other. I don't have to worry about bound or unbound methods. This will work exactly the same way yours worked. And now, when I call object.message, it's called the one that I patched. However, there's a qualification. Because you might not want to change the existing class. Because if there were 10 objects that were created as instances of that class, you'd be changing all 10 of those. You might only want to change it in one very small, very narrow case. In the case of only one instance. Well, here, if I say object.message equals my message, what happens? This seems to work, but there's one, there's one corner case and one important qualification. Let's say I did something. I used a self variable. I said this is an instance method I'm swapping out, so it should look the same. It should have a self variable as well. When I do this patching, I get an error. Not enough arguments. Why not? I patch this on the instance. Remember, the descriptor protocol only kicks in to create a bound method once you move past the instance to the class. Because we never move past the instance to look this up, because the object itself in its dot dict had this definition, this doesn't work. And I want to show you how this works, and then we're done. So one way you can do this is you can perform the binding yourself. In the types module, there is a type, and you can just do the binding yourself. So here, I say object.message is a bound method of the my message function where the self parameter will be filled in with whatever object is. And this just works. And I want to show you one last way. Actually, I'll keep that on the screen for just one second. Then the very final set of slides, I'll show you one last way. Here's your class. I create my own class, and I swap out the classes at runtime. I say this object is not of your class, it's of my class. And this just works. But if you want to find out why, you have to come back to PyGotham 2017. Thank you so much. I don't think we have any time for questions, so we'll probably take questions outside the room. I hope you enjoyed this talk.